Hello, and welcome to this Cullen International webinar on the EECC, the European Electronic Communications Code. I think for the rest of the session, we'll just call it the code for simplicity. Um, allow us to uh, just take one minute to introduce ourselves and to give you some tips about how to use the, the webinar system. So my name is Peter Dunn. Um, I work in the analyst team here at Cullen. Um, I've, my background is in communications regulation, including some spells working for um, telecoms operators. And my name is Martin Skra. I've been following EU telecoms regulations here at Cullen for the last 12 years. Great. So I know most of you who've registered um, already know Cullen well, but for those who have haven't, just, just perhaps a couple of lines on, on who we are and what we do. Um, Cullen is a provider of regulatory intelligence, which means we um, provide news and analysis of regulatory developments across the communications sectors, including competition law cases affecting those sectors. Um, our sort of primary feature really is our independence. Um, because we don't do advisory work, it means that our clients can really trust us to give straightforward and impartial information to them. Okay, so that's the introduction. First, a, a couple of tips on the webinar um, system. You'll be able to find easily, I hope, um, some background documentation um, covering the topics we're talking about, including the slides that we're going to use today. Um, you can also ask us questions online. We'll try and address those either as we go through the presentation we're going to make or at the end. We'll allow some time for questions at the end to try and pick up some points that people have raised. Um, and if we don't get around to answering any of those questions, we'll follow up after the webinar has, has finished. We'll also find there a survey which would be very grateful if you could um, complete. Um, it'll give us some feedback on um, the webinar itself as well. Um, okay, so I think that's, that's the preliminaries over. Let's um, kick into the uh, code itself. So uh, for the next 40 minutes or so, um, we will take you to the main topics of the uh, code. Uh, we will focus um, on uh, access regulation, on co-investment, on spectrum and end user rights. Um, we will do this in a kind of uh, Q&A format. Um, we will interview each other to present the, uh, the questions that we think that um, people may have about the uh, code. Um, as uh, we will see, um, there will be three themes emerging, um, one, um, one, more, one or two standard ones and one uh, new one, um, when we look at the uh, aims that the Commission had in its initial proposal. Um, so uh, first and foremost, the Commission wants to, um, wants to update the, uh, the, telecoms, uh, the telecoms framework. Um, it has been more than 10 years ago that, uh, that this happened last. The uh, last review took, um, took place between 2006-2008. Um, furthermore, the Commission, as it usually uh, does, um, has a stride in its proposal to, um, to, to increase EU-level harmonization, so to, so to, um, so to take um, powers from the member states and to, and to implement them uh, at, EU, at EU level, in particular, for example, at uh, Spectrum. And uh, what, would be, what would be new is that the code uh, serves a specific goal of, um, of furthering um, um, two, uh, two, uh, two, uh, two, two uh, targets to the rollout of, um, of, five, of 5G and the uh, creation of a gigabit society both by 2025 and also to create the, um, the, um, um, the, the um, investment incentives to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to fund that. So the uh, gigabit society would mean that by 2025, uh, the Commission would like uh, that all European households, whether they are uh, urban or in the countryside, uh, would have access um, to 100 megabits per second download uh, speed, and these connections should be upgradable to, um, to um, uh, gigabit uh, speed. At the same time, by the end of 2025, um, there should be uninterrupted deployment um, um, and uninterrupted, uninterrupted coverage, both um, um, of, of 5G, um, also covering the main terrestrial transport uh, paths. Um, we should bear in mind that these targets come on top of the, of the goals that the, that the EU has already set itself for 2020 in, with the uh, digital agenda for uh, Europe, which includes, um, access, uh, which includes access for all households to at least um, 30 megabits per second 
um, and uh, half of uh, all subscribers should be using a connection faster than 100 megabits per second. Um, there's obviously a big price tag connected to these additional um, ambitions. Um, the, the numbers vary, but it's, uh, but it's about hundreds of billions of, um, of uh, euros. Um, and um, what is what is um, and what we see is that there is an investment gap. So, um, so most money to to realize the the ambitions for for the gigabit society and 5G uh, should be coming from the private sector. And this investment gap amounts to about 150 billion euros. Um, and that is just for the additional targets. Um, so the code tries to create the incentives for operators to invest, um, and we will now have a look at a few of those. So, Peter, access regulation and co-investment, it's the, it's the big chunk of the, of the okay. reform. Um, so NRAs will be able to impose symmetric access obligations on um, on, on on operators. Can that's you... right. That's one of the that's one of the, the big new things I think coming out of the code. Um, so the idea is that NRAs will be able to impose access obligations on any <coughs> provider of electronic communications networks and owners of um, wiring and cables who are not network providers. And the critical part here is that you don't have to show um, significant market power. That's the big difference to today's situation. And so the network elements that um, access can be um, mandated for are wiring, cables, and so-called associated facilities um, inside the building or outside the building up to the first concentration or distribution point. Um, and that point is to be determined by the NRA on a sort of local basis. Um, and that access can be mandated um, when replication of the network assets is economically inefficient otherwise or physically impractical. And so that's the, the crucial, crucial test here. And then those access conditions can include obviously access, transparency, non-discrimination, and some apportionment of costs as well, including some risk element. And on which parties would these obligations be imposed? It would be only on network operators, but also on, on the owners of, um, of, of, of buildings, for example, so parties that are not uh, telecoms operators. Exactly. <clears throat> in a way, it kind of has to be both, because it's inside building access, and that makes sense, I think, in the, in the code. Um, so it's that. And when it says network operators, it's not just the incumbents, if you like, the, the normal SMP operators, but also, for example, cable operators, potentially. Right. So, so in principle, all network operators can be subject to these uh, symmetric access obligations. Indeed. Yeah. Right. And will these obligations be limited to the first concentration point only? No, I mean, that's, I mean I, in my first explanation, I, I mentioned the first concentration point. But in fact, NRAs will have the um, discretion to extend the access obligations beyond the first concentration point um, if, um, and it's an important if, um, the point to which it wants to extend it is, is the, makes it commercially viable, if you like, for an efficient operator based upon the, um, a sufficient number of end users. Um, so these are terms yet to be defined bluntly. Right, but NRAs can also decide not to extend access, um, access um, obligations beyond the, uh, the first, uh, the first the, the distribution point. That's right. I mean, I think this is a, it's clear that this is a discretionary power. Um, so in, in, in any case, it's up to the NRA to decide whether or not to impose it. And in certain cases, in particularly for wholesale-only networks, um, the NRA is not allowed to um, impose these symmetric access obligations. Right. So these obligations sound rather convoluted. It's, it's, um, um, there are a lot of conditions, a lot of, um, there are some exemptions. Um, how, how would this work in practice, do you think? Well, I, mean, it's, it, I think it's, a lot is going to go down to the Barrett guidance, which is going to be required um, by the end of 2020, which is the, the same as the transition, uh, transposition period for the, the code. Um, so Barrett has got to work out a lot of these details. Um, including you know, how you define the first concentration or distribution point and what number of end-user connections will be commercially viable for an efficient operator if you go beyond the first concentration or distribution point. Right. 
So um, the, um, the, um, the code, the EECC, wants to stimulate the rollout of very high capacity networks, a VHCN. <laughs> um, first of all, what is a very high capacity network? Yeah, as, and we're all going to have to learn some new acronyms in this code, right? So, so a VHCN is an electronic communications network that consists wholly of optical fiber elements, at least up to the distribution point. Or, and this is the sort of new provision that is put in, one, a network that is capable of delivering similar network performance. And it's this second part of the provision um, that was introduced to make the um, definition of VHCN more, network, uh, more technology neutral. Although it's, it's clear, really, from the provisions in the rest of the code that you know, the VHCN definition is, is really wrapped around a fiber network. And what we've heard a lot about co-investment is that uh, critic casters have called it a regulatory holiday. Uh, do you think that they have a point? Well, if it's a holiday, um, it's one the S&P operators have to work pretty hard for, I think. Um, so there's a lot of hoops that they have to go through. Um, and you know, if it was intended, which it clearly was, I think, by the Commission to offer some kind of incentive for investment, it... It might still do so, but it, you know, the jury's out on whether it really will be effective in that, in that context. Right, yeah, it's, it's also an inherent part of the political process, I suppose. Yeah, absolutely. Because yeah. the commission um, always uh, usually intends to, to present a reform, uh, a radical reform at some point, some, some uh, times. The European Parliament would usually like to, like to take an even more ambitious approach. At the same time, the Council, the Member States, uh, would be inclined to, um, to, uh, to, to, uh, to, um, to slow it down a bit, uh, not to give uh, away too much powers of Member States to, uh, to, to make and to implement uh, rules. Um, and bearing in mind that both the Parliament and the Council have to agree on the exact outcome, um, it, is, it is unavoidable that there would be uh, rot com Co compromises with some woolly language at uh, some point. Yeah, and that's kind of what we've ended up with here, right? So, Indeed. Yeah. So let's go through the basics of these co-investment uh, uh, provisions. Okay, so just a, as an overview, I think it's worth explaining that first before going into the, the gritty details. <clears throat> what happens is that an SMP operator will be able to offer commitments um, in, the, in the terms of, of co-investment proposals open to alternative operators. And if those proposals meet certain conditions, and there's quite a few conditions, um, then the NRA can make those commitments binding on the SMP operator. Um, and in return, as, you know, if, as a payback, if you like, the SMP operator then will be exempted from ex ante regulation. So, so who can propose these uh, commitments? Uh, yeah, it's SMP operators, basically those who are subject to regulation today. And would it apply to, to specific types of uh, networks? Uh, yeah, it only applies to VHCN, and in particular, and it's very clear in the text of the code, it applies to only those VHCN consisting of optic fiber elements up to the end user premises or to mobile base stations. And um, what would constitute Co-investment. Can you give us a few examples? Yeah, so um, co-investment means either co-ownership or it means some kind of long-term risk-sharing risk deal, uh, which can be in the form of co-financing or some kind of purchase agreement, but which has a kind of structural long-term element to it. Right. And, and what would be the features of your typical co-investment offer? Well, um, it, there, there are sort of three broad areas, really. Um, one is that the co-investment um, is open uh, at any point during the lifetime of the network to, and to any provider um, of electronic communication services or, or networks. So first of all, the commitments must be open. The co-investment must be open. Secondly, the nature of the um, proposal must, be, must allow for sustainable downstream competition. I'll explain a bit more about that. And thirdly, even for non-participants in the co-investment, they must still be allowed access um, to the network. In terms of sustainability, um, there are some very clear details here that the terms of co-investment must be fair, reasonable, and non-discriminatory. They've got to allow access to the full capacity of the network that's subject to co-investment. The co-investment must be flexible in terms of the value 
and the timing under which people can participate. It must allow co-investors the possibility to increase their participation over time. And there's some allowance for reciprocal rights for co-investors as well. Um, so that's sustainability. And then in terms of non-participants, um, access seekers who don't take part in the co-investment must still be able to access the very high capacity network on non-discriminatory terms, but taking into account the risks taken by the other co-investors on different terms, basically. Um, and those non-participants must be able to benefit from the same quality, speed, conditions as they had before the, the, the co-investment took place. So these are quite a stringent set of conditions, in fact. Indeed, and um, you also mentioned that NRA should make commitments binding once they pass these, uh, all these yeah. criteria. How, how, how would that work? Well, I mean, they, well, they're, made, they're made binding by, by the regulator and under a critical condition, and this is a really important one, that, that at least one potential co-investor has actually entered into a co-investment agreement with the SMP operator. So you can't even start the process until you have an agreement for, for co-investment. And then once you have, the, have made the commitment binding with the, in, in terms of an agreement with the NRA, essentially, um, then the NRA has, must relieve you from some ex-ante obligations, um, including all the regular ones, so transparency, discrimination, accounting separation, access to civil engineering networks, and price control, um, with some exceptions. If there, are, if there are some significant competition problems which cannot be addressed, then it's still possible to have some ex-ante obligations. So in kind of conclusion, you can see that if you have this co-investment um, proposal, you go through lots of hoops, you then have a set of binding commitments which allows your co-investing partners to compete with you downstream and allows non-participants in the co-investment still to have access. Then you get regulatory relief, which is... Yeah, it's not much of a holiday, let's put it that way, going back to your first point. Indeed. And so, so this is the outcome of a lengthy negotiation process between Parliament and the Council based on a Commission proposal. Um, so so um, it, it, it's hard to keep track of all these different versions that have been flying yeah, around. Sure. At, at Colin, we've been trying to be helpful about this. Yeah. Yeah, so, so what we have, and, and you know, I think probably many people have done this themselves, but we've put in a very easy... Um, tool here, the Cullen Legislation Navigator, that's allowed us through the, the negotiation process to track the different versions of the text. Um, I think later today you'll be able to see instead, or, or as well as, to compare the, the current version of the text, the, the new code, if you like, with the, the previous um, um, framework text. Um, so you can easily compare between the, you know, the, the different versions and see what's changed and what has not, and, and you know, really analyze that in detail. Thank you. So um, a topic that is quite closely related to co-investment and access and semantic metric access is the market analysis um, process, uh, which has undergone gone several uh, changes. Um, so during the last telecoms review, um, the commission tried to have a veto on, 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 uh, on remedies like it has on SMP designation and on market uh, definition. Um, that did not fly. Uh, what, happened, what happened this time? This time there was a proposal for a so-called double lock veto. Yeah, so the double lock veto um, made it, if you like, but it's limited to only certain types of decision. In fact, quite a limited um, set of remedies. It's, it's, it's lim not, sorry, not limited set of remedies, to a limited set of decisions that affect remedies. And those are, the double lock veto only applies to decisions on co-investment, um, so what we've just been talking about, and also symmetric access, so really the first two topics we've been talking about. And it only applies to symmetric access to those decisions where the NRA goes beyond the first concentration or distribution point. However, having said that the double lock veto is, you know, kind of, limited very much in scope. What the Commission did push through was ability to set EU-wide termination rates for fixed and mobile, um, which if you take those two things together, I think overall the Commission's really got a much tighter grip on remedies than it had before. Right, and, and just to be complete, a double lock veto means that Barrack has to agree with the yeah. Commission. That's yeah, that. yeah, that's right. Sorry, sorry, you're right, quite right, Martin. So the Commission you know, objects and Barrack has to agree and then it becomes a veto. So EU level determination rates, that's, um, that's, that is quite something. Um, how, how, when, what? 
Yeah, I mean, I guess in a way, everyone's a bit relieved that we don't have to go through the endless termination rate debates, but you might still be unhappy about the results. Um, so the Commission has to adopt by um, the end of December 2020 a binding decision which will set maximum EU termination rates for fixed and for mobile um, voice. A decision will be reviewed every five years. And, and then in setting the maximum termination rates, the Commission has to assess the weighted average of efficient costs in fixed and mobile termination based upon the same pure bottom up lyric model that you're all familiar with. Um, and then the other part of that is that the maximum rate set in that decision cannot be higher than the highest rate that's applicable currently um, in EU member states. Right, so, and it will be reviewed every five years. That's right, yeah. So are there any other changes to the um, standard remedies that we've uh, come to know? Yeah, there, there's, a new, there's a new provision um, giving specific access, um, giving a specific access remedy for civil engineering. Now, in a way, this was kind of implicit previously, I think, in the access remedy, but this is a very specific one. And the reason it was in, introduced, really, if we remember back to the original commission proposal, was that the commission wanted to make it sort of mandatory for NRAs to consider civil engineering access as enough, and only if it's not enough, then to move on to the other types of access remedies. Um, in this case, that's fallen away. So the provision regarding civil engineering access remains, but it's not a sort of mandatory first step. It's something that the NRA should consider rather than have to go through. Right. But, but it still has a kind of, it, it's the first point of a, of a departure. Exactly. Principle. No, you're right. It's, it's, it's a clear implication, I think, in that, that that's what NRA should do first, consider civil engineering access, and then see if that's enough. And then a final question on this. Um, how long will the um, market analysis cycle be under the EECC? Yeah, this is something that the Commission has achieved, and I think quite a lot of um, SMP operators will be happy about, hopefully, is that um, it's moved from three-year period to a five-year review period, so there'll be a bit more stability, hopefully, in the regulatory process. Right. Thank you. So let's move on to let's move on to uh, to uh, Spectrum. Um, one of one of the main chunks of the uh, of the uh, of the review with the Commission in 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 the particular um, having um, having several plans to to harmonise Spectrum. P -p -p policy at, at, EU, at, at EU level more than is the case uh, these uh, days. Um, so, um, this, so this would include a, um, a longer license du du duration, um, um, a, a peer review of, of national spectrum uh, measures. Um, so has the Commission succeeded in this quite radical uh, reform? Yeah, I think the short answer is no. Um, so I think we all knew leading into the um, negotiations that member states would be very reluctant to give up their um, powers on, on spectrum issues, and that has proved to be the case, in fact. Um, so some of the measures have gone through, but, but really not so many. Right. So we, so we now see in, in, in the code that there is a, that is, that there is a minimum dura, um, license duration rate of, uh, um, of, of, um, of 15 years. It's, it's been marketed as 20 years. Uh, it's in fact um, 15 plus 5. How, yeah. does, um, how is that? Yeah, well, the, the provision in, in the code says that there should be regulatory certainty for 20 years. Um, this is for harmonized uh, spectrum bands. Um, and so how that plays out is that the minimum license duration for harmonized spectrum should be 15 years with the right to extend, um, you know, for at least five years, basically. Um, you have to remember back to the fact that the Commission was asking for 25 years, that the Parliament was asking for 25 years with a review after 10 years, and the, um, the rapporteur, Pilar de Castillo, was asking for 30 years even. So... I mean, to roll back to 20 years um, is, is quite a yeah, it's quite significant change, let's say. Indeed. And so will this make a change in, 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 in practice, this duration? This well, I guess for some countries it will. Um, but in, on average, I don't think so. There was a council paper that showed that the average license duration for Spectrum was 17 years, I think. So which doesn't look very different to 15 plus 5. <laughs> And um, will um, license durations of an unlimited term still be allowed? Yes, that, that's not absolutely clear from the, on, on the face of the, the specific provision in the code, but if you read the recitals and, and look at closely at the text, you can see that 
unlimited duration licenses like they have in the UK, for example, um, will still be allowed to continue. Yeah. All right. And uh, Spectrum uh, measures now have to be subject to a peer review at European level. Um, is it really a peer review? Is it, uh, is it voluntary? Is it mandatory? How does it... Uh yeah, this was another one, if you remember, of the, um, the big ideas of the Commission to have a, a peer review process for Spectrum um, decisions, particularly um, license awards. Uh, that would be similar to the Article 7 process for market reviews. Um, in fact, it's been watered down very substantially now. Um, so the original idea was to have BEREC um, undertake this review. It's now going to be done by the RSPG, which is a kind of purely advisory group. Um, also, the, the reviews will only take place if the um, NRA proposing, or the ministry or whatever authority is proposing the uh, license award, asks for it to be done. So it's a vol purely voluntary review process. Um, there'll only be a report after the review takes place if the NRA asks for it. Um, now, there are certain backstop provisions that the RSPG can, on its own initiative, undertake a review, but the circumstances seem to be quite extreme, let's say, before that would happen. So it looks to me more and more like this will be a power or a possibility that's seldom used. Right, and, and what would you then, uh, considering everything, um, see as the most tangible re results of the reform um, on, on that spectrum? Yeah, well, it's, it's quite interesting that with all the proposals that you know, came out on spectrum, this is kind of the, one of the main aspects of the Commission proposals, the ones that are most kind of notable now at the end are ones that were introduced during the process, right? So, so um, and these are um, two provisions relating to 5G spectrum, um, in particular to mandate the release um, of um, 5G spectrum in the 3.4 to 3.8 gigahertz bands and at least one gigahertz of spectrum in the 26 gigahertz band by the end of 2020. And also a provision that says that f where spectrum is harmonized at EU level, um, that should be released within two and a half years at the latest from the harmonization um, date. And then the third element, which is, which is always there, but is got, got, got a bit lost perhaps, is um, to make it much easier for operators, and not just operators in fact, to roll out wireless access points, um, small cell wireless access points, so local area wireless access points. And you know, this, this will apply some kind of consistent approach at national level. It will remove the need for planning permission. It will limit these kinds of charges that can be applied, the fees that can be applied for, for rolling out such networks. It will also give operators the possibility to um, demand, if you like, access to public buildings to put up such uh, small cell sites. And the Commission will issue binding rules at some point to define uh, what is a, a, a small cell, what can be their energy output, for example. Exactly, yeah, exactly right. Yeah. So, um, so that would be spectrum. Uh, let's move on to another also quite contentious issues that, 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 um, that took a lot of a discussion. The, um, the review of the, um, rule of the uh, rights for end users and in particular uh, the regulation were not of, of OTTs, of over-the-top uh, players. Um, so um, the concept of ECS, Electronic communi Communication Services, uh, Peter, has been redefined into different categories. Can you, can you take us uh, through them? Okay, so here's where I'm going to get my um, words tangled up because there's a lot more acronyms here. <clears throat> so we have um, four categories really, um, three if you like, but one is subdivided. So the first is internet access service providers, so what we're going to call IAS I hope from now on, um, and that's defined under the TSM regulation. Um, it kind of explains itself I think. Then you have providers of interpersonal communication services, ICS, um, and you have two categories of those. You have number-based um, ICS and you have number-independent ICS. And the number-based ones are essentially like the, the traditional voice fixed and mobile providers that, that, we, that we know and love, if you like. And the second, the number-independent, um, these are operators that route their do not route their communications based upon numbers. They might still use numbers as an addressing mechanism, but it's not the same. Um, and essentially, that's what we call OTTs in this context. Um, and then the fourth category, again, is one that's always been there. This is providers of this is the 
conveyance of signals, particularly for MTOM or broadcasting signals. Right, and will the same um, um, uh, pr pr protection apply to, to all end users in Europe and will it apply to all services? Yeah, so if, if we wait for a minute to describe which particular conditions apply to which type of provider, <clears throat> I think one of the things that the Commission has achieved is this idea of max, uh, maximum harmonization of end user rights um, across the EU. Um, so yes, it will apply to the rules of end, on, I can't speak, on end user rights will apply um, to all providers <clears throat> um, and, and, no, and countries can't do more or less than what's in the code. Um, there are some exceptions on that we'll come back to. Um, one exception is to do with micro enterprises. Um, yeah, so as it sounds, very small companies, fewer than 10 employees, providing number independent ICS. Um, and also, member states can temporarily, um, until the end, that's what was it, until the end of 2021, so one year after the transposition deadline, um, maintain any stronger rules that they currently have in place. Um, but they have to notify the Commission about those. Indeed, and there is an exception for micro enterprises, yeah, yeah. Uh, which would be small um, um, c companies with a turnover of two million um, euros on an annual basis and less than ten employees. If I'm right, yes, that's right. Yes. So, um, are there um, additional um, um, obligations imposed through the through the code on on uh, operators? Well, well, yes, there are. I mean, I, th I think quite a lot of the additional obligations of uh, quite a lot of this. The, the categories of obligations have been detailed in, in fur, you know, further, um, and also they've been extended. Many of those provisions applied only to consumers before, and now they'll also apply also to small and, me, and, and micro enterprises and not for profit organizations. In many cases, they have the possibility to opt out, but I guess the question is why, why would they do that? Um, shall, shall we go through through some of the main changes sure. that, that have been imposed? So uh, there is the contract information. So um, operators need to include certain features, certain elements in their in, in the contracts that they uh, that they have with with uh, end users. Um, have there been any any changes in uh, those? Yeah. So the, there's now going to be a, a sort of a binding sort of summary template of contract conditions which all operators um, must use. <coughs> Um, and in fact, these provisions on contract information apply to um, not just IAS operators, but also ICS number-based and number-independent as well. Um, there must also be sp there's some specific information that's uh, highlighted that must be provided now, including on sort of quality of service aspects of internet access services, obviously only applying to internet access service providers. There are conditions on providing information about the fees for early contract termination, and unlocking, unlocking terminal equipment, and also what are the compensation levels if certain quality of service um, targets are not achieved. Right, so, so there will be more elements in the contract, but there will also be, fortunately, a, a standardized way of, of, of summarizing it. Exactly, exactly. Right, and how about switching providers, one of the main elements for a, uh, for, for, for competition in the electronic communications uh, market. Yeah, that's been strengthened as well. I mean, so, so now it extends really to what we call you know, internet access services, really. So um, there's got to be free of charge email forwarding or an ability to access your emails after you've left a provider. Um, there's a requirement to maintain the continuity of services during the, pro during the switching process, um, unless that's technically somehow not feasible. Um, in terms of number portability, the end user can retain for one month after he leaves the provider the right to go back and ask for his number, number back. Um, and also, member states can now um, set rules for compensation in case of some kind of failure in the switching yeah. process. They're even obliged to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to okay. do that. Right. Yes. And, and that would <laughs> include if, you, um, if, if a service appointment is not met, then there should be a, a certain uh, compensation for, for okay. that. Um, and contract duration, um, two years is still the standard? It is the standard. I mean, what, what it does allow for now in the code is a, a longer contract uh, duration possibility um, where there's what the so-called installment contract. So basically, this is only applying to physical connections for internet access and, and um, interpersonal communication services, but only number-based ones. 
um, in particular for VHCN. So I think the, the ambition behind this proposal, this extension, is to say that you know, in order to justify rolling out a fiber cable to your home, you have to sign a five years contract and pay it off over five years, that would be allowable under the, the terms of the new code. Right, and it would also allow, for example, neighbors and communities to group and to pool yeah. their, their de demand and make it more attractive for telecoms operators to, in fact, roll out such a network. Yeah, exactly. It's going back to what you said at the beginning about um, having you know, the, main, the main themes being to incentivize investment and, and the rollout of the gigabit society. Indeed, and then there is the, the issue of bundles, so yep. more and more people use um, electronic communication services combined with, with other services, for example, uh, TV, um, that is now being addressed in the code as well. Yeah, I guess, I guess it's, a, it's a way of, um, I mean, addressing very, very much that sort of market um, position, that the code says that if you buy a bundle, um, that includes at, l at least an internet access service or a publicly available number-based ICS, <clears throat> then some of the provisions, the consumer-based provisions of the code will apply to every element in the bundle, even those which are not um, captured normally by the, by the code. Um, so that would apply to the information on contract, um, the format of certain terms and conditions of the contract, the contract duration, and some of the switching proposals as well. Mm. So these are all quite significant um, additional obligations, uh, but during the negotiation process we heard most about, um, about two uh, issues that were not in the original yep. proposal. Uh, so the capping of intra-EU uh, calls and SMSs and a public warning system in case of uh, disasters. And these are parliamentary introductions, right? They are. <coughs> yeah, so on, on intra-EU calls, so it's, it's kind of very similar to the, the roaming proposal, if, the roaming rules, if you like. So now um, voice calls and SMS um, calls between um, EU member states will be capped at 19 euro cents for voice calls and 6 euro cents for SMS. Um, these are the same levels, in fact, as the um, caps for um, roaming, um, roaming when roaming like at home does not apply. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and those rules will apply automatically from the 15th of May next year, 2019. So they do not depend upon transposition. It's an amendment to the Berwick regulation. Yes, which in turn then amends the uh, TSM uh, regulation which deals with Rome like at home. Yeah. Indeed. And then on the public warning system, well, I, I mean, I'm not sure how, how widespread this effect will be or if that will change over time. Um, essentially, this is a rule that says providers of number-based ISCs, essentially your old voice and mobile um, services, they have to communicate to end users any national emergency public warnings where the country has a, such a public warning system in place. Um, and, and that must happen, that must take place by mid-2022, so there's quite a long sort of runoff period to allow um, operators to set that up. Um, but this would also um, allow um, um, Member states to, to, to extend these obligations to issue public warnings to, to OTTs under certain circumstances. That's right. I mean, I, I think it, it kind of depends upon the market situation, right? I think where, where it's, um, those OTTs are you know, really providing most of the services to people, then, then they can, they've got the flexibility to extend that. Indeed. So, so this takes us to our next um, question, actually. Are OTTs being, actually being regulated under the... Uh, under the code. Well, to some extent they are. But as I said at the beginning, they, they have to comply with certain of the end user rights provisions, um, particularly those on contract information, mm -hmm. and where they charge for those services, they, the, the charging rules will apply to them as well. Um, and, and also there's, a, there's some possibility for NRAs to extend existing rules which do not cover number independent ICS providers also to those providers. Indeed. And is there a possibility that OTTs will be more regulated in the future? Yeah, there, there is a provision that allows for NRAs to um, require interoperability between OTTs. How, however, I mean, I think if you look at the various caveats that are required there, or the conditions under which that's required, you know, in particular, it really requires a, a complete collapse, if you like, of the traditional communication systems that we use today, um, such that the number of independent ICS systems are the main ones being used by most people. And then there has to be a commission decision um, saying that you know, this, this is something that should be considered before the extension of um, end user, the full panoply of end user regulations will apply. 
So, but never the 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 less. Although it seems to be unlikely for the, for the, the moment, it doesn't mean that that OTT operate. Uh, providers are necessarily off the hook because there will be a review every three years. That's right, and, and the Commission says um, specifically um, that the direct review that's going to look at these end user rights conditions um, will should take particular notice of number independent ICS providers and the extent to which they're prevalent in the market. Indeed, and based on that BEREC report, you, the Commission can then d d d decide to, to propose additional regulation or legislation. Yep. Yep. Right. Um, so let's move on to governance, the review, the uh, reform of BEREC right. and the, um, and the, um, and the tasks of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of uh, NRAs. Um, will all NRAs now have the same tasks uh, under, the e, under the EECC? Uh, bluntly, no. <laughs> so this is one of the proposals of the Commission, but um, now there's, there's really a small number of tasks that have, uh, that have been harmonised, really. And in particular for Spectrum, which is something that the Commission was keen that um, NRAs um, and should have, um, it, it's kind of something and nothing. It says that um, radio spectrum management should be included within an NRA's remit if that's, if that's within their remit. <laughs> and if it's not, then they should advise on the kind of market aspects of, of radio spectrum management. Right. And the, the Commission, I recall, wanted to turn BEREC into a single EU agency and, and, and with a legal p p personality and expand its remits. What, uh, what, what has happened there? Yeah, that hasn't happened either. <laughs> um, so Beric, you know, Beric will maintain its two-tier status. Um, they'll have the board of regulators um, without legal personality, um, which does most of the sort of, you know, the real work, if you like. And then the office in, in Riga, which will have, they have the legal personality, but is mainly concerned with administration and management of, of, of Beric. Right, and but, but has Beric's role nevertheless be reinforced in one way or another? Yeah, it, it has. I mean, I think you know, it, now that the Commission and NRAs must take utmost account of, of Beric's decisions and opinions and recommendations. So, so yeah, I think it, Beric will have come out, come out stronger from this process, but not to the extent that the Commission had proposed. Right. So that's, um, that's the, those are the main topics that we have covered about the, uh, about the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, code. There's... Uh, um, so let's have a look of what is next. So the work, most of the work has been, has been uh, done, um, but there's still a lot to do actually. Uh, first and foremost, the um, code needs to be adopted. Uh, this is work in, 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 in the progress. The uh, European Parliament is uh, expected to have a vote um, in November. Um, after that, the Council, um, if, if the European Parliament then agrees with the uh, compromise that has been reached, then the Council has to formally adopt it. Um, it will then um, enter into force if everything goes well, probably by the end of 2018, which means that, that then the clock starts ticking for member states to transpose it into national law uh, within two years, so by the end of 2020. So by the beginning of 2021, the code should be fully effective for all m m member states. Um, as we, um, there are a few Pro pro provisions, however, that require a bit of, uh, of uh, that, that have some separate uh, timing. For example, um, the, um, the release of, uh, of wireless broadband uh, spectrum, uh, like Peter mentioned, in the 3.4, 3.8 gigahertz band and in the 26 uh, uh, gigahertz band, um, that, will be, that is expected uh, by the end of, um, of uh, 2018. Um, 2020 and the um, the um, 2020. 2020. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the um, the intra EU um, the intra EU um, um, calls that will be 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 kept uh, that will enter into force, like we said, uh, by mid May 2019. Um, by end 2020, um, um, yeah, like we said, the um, Let's see, and uh, there's the public warning yeah, system. Is that's that's supporting me. Sorry, it's uh, yeah. <laughs> so. And then by then by mid 2020, um, there will be the uh, the public warning uh, system. So that's uh, the these provisions will then enter into into force. 
And then we're all over with the code, right? We can stop then. Oh, yes, yes. Then we can uh, <laughs> retire in... Uh, um, Absolutely not. So, um, um, as, as, as we said, Barak um, will need to issue um, a lot of guidance. Uh, we've identified about th uh, um, 11 um, immediate um, topics on which they need to provide a report or, or, or uh, guidelines. And uh, under the new reform of the, um, of the Barak regulation, um, uh, NRA, so the Barak members, have to take utmost account uh, not only of guidelines, but also of of reports and and other uh, deliverables by 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 uh, Berec. Um, the European Commission has the has the option, in most cases, not the obligation, but still the option to uh, issue binding rules um, um, on uh, 13 different uh, topics. They will do that through comitology, which is the process in which they engage with member uh, states. Um, and 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 to to set binding rules, which is also quite a process in and on itself. And we have um, in the next few years three separate reviews uh, scheduled. Um, so first, there will be the review of the relevant market recommendation by the end of 2020. Uh, so by the time that the uh, framework is that the code is uh, transposed. Um, then there is the separate um, end user, um, the separate review of end user rights, and uh, in particular of the role of, uh, of OTTs uh, by the end of 2021. And finally, this is new, there will be a, a review uh, every five years of the framework in, um, as, a, 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 as a whole. Uh, for now, this was not, um, this was not Regulated, it, it it took quite it took it, it it took quite some 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 time, um, but now the first re review will take place by the end of 2025. Um, so we will now always be in a in a state of flux where one review has just ended and needs to be implemented with the other one already uh, looming. So no uh, early retirement for <laughs> for any of us. Um, so let's let's wrap it up. Um, so what we what we think we have seen the, the kind of the kinds of trends and conclusions is that um, is that the commission uh, on on several in several instances uh, did not quite get what 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 it, what it wanted. Um, on one of the most important uh, issues, the uh, in the incentives for investment in fiber and 5G, the jury is uh, still out. We will just simply have to have to see uh, whether it's uh, whether the uh, elaborate procedures creates a, an interest. Um, uh, how it will work in 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 uh, practice. Um, so we'll have to see about that. I think it's fair to say that the um, in, that the aim of having increased influence on spectrum uh, policy uh, at EU level uh, has not uh, succeeded. Um, the review of governments governance more or less the the, the same. Not 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 really. Significant. Uh, we can say that there is at least a bit of more clarity on 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 the regulation of OTTs, um, but some uh, parties, some operators, might contend that there's not a, a real level playing field still. And um, a notable success, um, I would say, is the maximum harmonisation of of uh, end user rights. So the same uh, end user rights will, uh, in due time, apply in all of uh, Europe. And then we've got these two, these two particularly new things I think we've we talked about, which is this coordinated release of 5G spectrum, both in the specific bands that they've identified <coughs> and also for future bands as well with this two and a half year sort of um, timeline. And of course, the parliamentary introduced um, propose, or not proposes rules on the capping of uh, intra-EU calls, um, as well as the reverse um, 112 system as well. Indeed. So thank you, Peter. That was... Uh... That was uh, quite a lot. Let, let's yeah. see if, if there are any. Let's see if there are any 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 questions from from the audience. Yeah. Um, we. I see that we have a question about um, about universal service. Yeah. Because that that indeed was also part of the of the uh, of the reform. Yeah. Um, so what is happening there? It's, it's um, universal service is the kind of safety net uh, for yes. for users with. Um, that's uh, to make sure that they can that, that everyone has has a 
connection, or at least that used to be the case, is that, is that still the same? Yeah, so universal service as a concept will still exist, uh, but it's focused now very much more on internet access, um, internet services, um, what is now called affordable, adequate broadband services, in fact. Um, which can include voice services as well. Mm -hmm. Before, the, the definition, as I'm sure people will remember, was very much on voice and what they called functional internet access services. Now that the so-called adequate broadband services must allow um, the user to be able to access a set of given services that's set out in an annex to the, to the code. Mm -hmm. And um, does it also mean that, there, um, that, that member states are required to set a minimum um, uh, bandwidth? It doesn't say that specifically, but it very much implies that, I think. Uh, I, I, it, the member states are, are required to look at the sort of average um, speed that's and the speed that's required to deliver those services and to define the, the broadband standard in, in the same, you know, to meet those, meet those capabilities which essentially to me says that it must be a, a minimum broadband speed, essentially. Right, because um, the, I, th I think that there is an annex in the code which, which lists the, the, kind of, the, the, kind of, the kind of services that you have yeah, to be able right. to use, like, like email, like internet banking, uh, e-governance, uh, online uh, education uh, tools. Um, so, um, so that needs uh, so that needs to be done, and I think that Barrack also will will issue a report with uh, with um, with some best uh, best practice, practices practices yeah. yeah. exactly. And then the other part of universal service, which is really important, I think, and, and something which was discussed a lot at the time of the Commission's proposals, was how it would be financed. Um, and here, the Commission was proposing that financing of universal service would only come from state funding. And in fact, they've had to row back on that now. The possibility exists to have an industry compensation fund as well as or in, in addition to um, state funding. Right. And it, it might be interesting to, to point out that, that the scope of the universal service has indeed been re uh, dramatically reduced. So it's now about, um, about, uh, about, um, about um, um, adequate broadband, uh, about, about affordable and adequate broadband. Um, um, also, traditional voice services would still be included, just like um, provisions for disabled end users. Yeah. Um, would that mean that, that that member states cannot decide to include others, other um, items like pay phones or things like, like no, that? In that? No, they can, they can keep, the ex keep some of the existing ones if they justify them, and they can also add new ones if they can justify them. Mm -hmm. um, but the financing of those additional ones would not be borne by industry. Right. Um, do we have time for more questions? I think we, I think we, I hear that we do. Okay. Um, so there's one here on, um, uh, there's one here on spectrum license renewal. Spectrum license renewal, yes. So, um, so it says now in the current proposal that, uh, that, that, that operators need, need the certainty that their, that their license will be renewed within a timely manner. Um, but it's not very specific about what that about what about what that would be. Um, it was three years in the original commission proposal, and now um, it should be at least it should it should not be done uh, earlier than five years before okay. the, uh, the the expiry of. So the we've got the process. commission proposal. We'll give a hard target of three years now. Yes. Now limited to somewhat more generic in a, in a timely Indeed. manner. Right. So another example of the spectrum reform not being quite as ambitious as intended say, by the Commission. Okay, okay. And time for a last question, <laughs> maybe? Let's see. All right, let's see what else we have. Um, okay, there's a, there's a question about if there are other access measures in the, in the code. Um, what did we talk We talked about symmetric access, we talked about co-investment, um, and the civil engineering. We talk, um, um, did we talk access? about uh, wholesale only? Oh no, no, I don't think we did. So uh, wholesale only access. So this is a again, it's a, it's a sort of a, um, a regulatory relief, if you like, or light touch treatment of wholesale only operators who are defined in, in, a, in a, you know quite stringent terms. Basically, the operator, the wholesale only operator, cannot be active in the retail market at all. And if if that's the case then the NRA can decide to subject that, um, apply remedies to the operator only of a certain kind. So um, non-discrimination, 
um, accounting separation access at civil engineering level and network access, but not specifically on transparency and price control. Um, however, there is a requirement, there's a potential requirement to have um, reasonable prices. So it's, it's slightly relaxed, but not incredibly relaxed, I would say. Right. Um, so I think we're about to near the end of yep. our, our <laughs> broadcast. Um, if you have any more questions, um, please refer to me. You can find my, my details in the uh, slide pack. And well, just, just, to, just from both of us to say thanks a lot for your attention and the participation with the, the questions. Uh, we hope you found the webinar um, interesting and, and useful. Just three quick points before we close. Um, one, please don't forget that you can um, re-watch the webinar if you wish, um, and you certainly download the slides and the other materials um, there. As Martin said, please send us any questions. If we haven't addressed them so far, we'll, we'll come back to you.